I am an intuitive and, and a feeling actor rather than a, a thinking actor. And that's why I wish I'd have brought my, I've got those rimless glasses, make me look intelligent. I would have preferred to have those for this interview, but. Galen's definitely an alchemist. I would say to her what I've said to very few directors, anytime, anywhere, for anything. Home by Christmas carries an enormous range of uh, responsibilities. A, I'm playing a quintessential Kiwi Jagger from the West Coast, admittedly. Uh, and it's not the first time I've played uh, Captain of the All Blacks. That's not a bad trick for an Aussie. <laughs> uh, but this one required a much deeper appreciation of what was at stake because I too believe that wars don't prove anything. And this was an opportunity to show how by allegiances, the cream of Australia and New Zealand men and some women were lost in conflicts that were really not of our own choosing. And I think this film, Home by Christmas, highlights the inanity and the stupidity and the corruption of war. Ed Preston. He's your good, true, blue, basic Kiwi Jagger who was around in his generation and is harder to find today. I think our individuality has been, and our sense of cheek uh, for authority has been replaced by a subservience to the status quo in ways that I don't consider particularly healthy. So I think uh, Ed Preston is a refreshing reminder of how a one-liner could cut through the pomposity of bureaucrats or authority figures and expose them for what they are, jumped up little buggers with a cap and a badge. And I think Ed was, um, he's, a, he's a man who I mourn the passing of. He was a man of his time and God willing, he'll come again. I used to often get mistaken for Barry Crump. I thought, that's outrageous. He had a rough head, <laughs> but he was a, he was a fine uh, Kiwi Jaco um, in all the senses and the connotations of that word. Uh, yeah, most of the, most Australians think I'm a Kiwi uh, because, particularly in the film industry, uh, I was fortunate enough to be involved with Bruno Lawrence and the. Electric Revelation and Travelling Apparition, Blurter. And that was like going to university for me. I was a working class kid from, from uh, Sydney. We toured together and travelled. That was like a tribe on the road, exploring the perimeters, really pushing the boundaries. And there was a very jazz orientated, jazz rock type band, 11 piece band. But going into areas that are deprived and with a cooking jazz rock band, throw up slides of Dago, or Michelangelo or Rembrandt, actually taking audiences to an art gallery that they probably wouldn't get the opportunity to see. I used to rave to all and sundry about Blurter because I thought it was cleverer and, and more innovative than Monty Python. Uh, and yet it came from this little country that was you know, emerging in the 70s, we're talking the 70s, it was just emerging in terms of its potential, creative potential. Bruno seduced me. <laughs> he came around one night when I was just about to watch the first episode of Pokemono and he knocked on the door. And I opened the door and uh, he had a bottle of beer with him. I think I had a joint or he did. And uh, he, I said, oh, good day. And he said, good day. I said, uh, I'm just about to watch a show. He said, yeah, I know. I said, well, come on in. He came in, we drank the beer, smoked the joint. He watched the show, at the end of it he got up, he said, you're good, and walked out the door. And I thought, you seductive bastard, you know. <laughs> so next thing I know that Grant McFarlane had said to me, Bruno's going on tour with the show, do you want to meet them? And, uh, and that's how it came about. Have you seen the film? Oh, right. there's a bit of homework for you. When you're trying to get a shot in a cave uh, down by the water and you're holding up electrical transformers and cables away from the water while they get the last shot. 
uh, knowing that at any time, <laughs> if you're weakened, you could be, and you'd probably electrocute everyone else around you as well. You know, well, amazing, amazing experience that, and speaking of innovation, the whole idea of the wild man. They made that and then realised if they had another 13 minutes, they would have a feature film. So they went out and shot 13 minutes. We would work all day and then drive 100, 200 k to the next location and get there into one of those little towns and there'd be nothing open. And so it'd be baked beans on toast if you, you know, and then, but, and I got paid, I think, 400 bucks a week because uh, Jeff Murphy said, well, I'm not going to pay Alan Bollinger, the cinematographer, more, less money than I'm paying you, so you're going to get the same. But the experience was invaluable and, uh, and the, the learning curve for an actor on that was because we did a lot of our own stunts. <laughs> and uh, jumping on the train and moving from carriage to carriage, uh, you know, yeah, it was just what you did. But it was, I think it was the film that enabled Kiwis to see themselves and not cringe at their accents or, and go, wow. This, I think the nature of the material touched that sort of um, individual subversive streak in New Zealanders too, where they go, <laughs> they could go on the ride in a way. That runs through all of us, doesn't it? Do you believe that spirit of uh, rebellion and sense of freedom? It's in all of us, but, uh, but we've got to pay the mortgage, we've got to toe the line, we've got to stay with the... Um, we've got to do the right thing to achieve and, and be seen to be successful rather than be successful in here. And I think that journey that Western man needs to take from here to here is one that's long overdue. And yet it was those guys like Ed who as they said when uh, he was on the train and home by Christmas with a, box, with a bag of beer. And the bloke said, oh, put that booze away, but was there no booze on the train. They said, oh, we're not in the army yet, we'll throw you off the train. You know, it's like, <laughs> so I'm sure the sergeant just went away and licked his wounds up in another carriage somewhere. It's like you know, having to go into uh, security at, the, at uh, the airports now. And you look at the heads on some of those security guards, they wouldn't get a job anywhere else. And they failed the police force, they couldn't get in the army, so they get jobs as security guards. And they want to manhandle you when you go through. And I tell them, use the back of your hand, that's your instructions, and, and stand over here, I beg your pardon? Stand over here, I said, sir or please. So I make them aware that, you know, I'm not just gonna succumb because they've got the badge. I'm not there as a terrorist. I'm not carrying in anything dangerous. And I demand to be treated with respect. And I think if we offer respect but demand it in return, then we'll come back to being a little more of who we are rather than who we're supposed to be. To be able to play against J.P.R. Williams and Gareth Evans, the gods of the 60s, and score a try on Carter Farms Park at 50 years of age on a 600 mil lens in slow motion. Talk about career highlights. You know. And it was wonderful to be accepted by, by you know, particularly the guys who, you, I'd watch the other actors pulling on the All Black Guernsey, you know, and those boyhood dreams were coming alive. <laughs> and, and I got to pull on the number eight, and Griswoldi would just look at me and shake his head and go, an Australian. <laughs> Martin was so good. I loved Martin Sanderson, he was one of my heroes, so I just, um, such humility, such grace, such a, such a frightening intellect, but the humility that goes with that when you know you've got it. Uh, yeah, I loved Martin dearly, like Bruno, and, you know, and a lot of old mates are gone. You know, Irv Hart, God rest him, is a mate, he's just gone. So you, know, you start to realise as you get on that uh, uh, nobody's got a, any guarantees. It's a daily proposition, this life game. <laughs>